Okay, and we started YouTube Live right now. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to all from Nepal. Good afternoon. Good to see that we have an international audience. Welcome. And we still have about five minutes. I can see people connecting. Feel free to say hello, everyone. Use the chat box for communication. And feel free to tell me in the chat box where you are from. So we have participants from Nepal, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia. India.
Taiwan. So it's wonderful to see that despite the fact that we cannot travel, we still have participants from a number of countries, Singapore, so thank you for sharing your time with us this Friday afternoon. Okay, it's 4.30. Let's just give people one more minute to connect. And we will start with the, with the lecture. I think it's uh, one minute past the due time, so we better start. Uh, welcome everyone to this last session of the radiobiology workshop in the era of precision medicine, kindly organized by uh, CFOM as part of ACOM professional courses run in 2021. And you will be treated to two fantastic speakers this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Jake Foster, who will be talking about the murder dosimetry, and Professor Loredana Marco, who will be talking about the latest developments in biomarkers. Before we can start, a couple of housekeeping rules. Please turn off your audio and video. This workshop is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. The link I have already sent through the Zoom chat. Uh, we will have the lectures following one after another, but post your comments as the lectures are proceeding in the chat room and we will then ask your questions after the lectures. And also please fill in the feedback form at the end of the workshop to receive your certificate. Next slide. So to conclude this, in my opinion, excellent series of lectures delivered to you over the last three weeks, we will be talking about, as I mentioned already, MERT formalism and the latest developments in the biomarker area. And this will be followed by uh, Dr. Chai Hong giving a wrap up of this series. So let's commence immediately with our first speaker, Dr. Jake Foster, who is a medical physics registrar at the South Australian Medical Imaging, specializing in nuclear medicine. He has a background in radiobiology and microdosimetry with interests in quantitative imaging and dosimetry of radionuclide therapy. Jake completed his PhD in 2018-2019 and actually received an award for the best medical physics PhD in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so Jake, over to you and looking forward to listening to your lecture. Thank you, Eva. I'll just share my slides. So yes, thank you Eva for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak. Oh, sorry, let me share. There we go. Yes, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to speak at this workshop on radiobiology held by ACOM. Uh, so the topic that I'm tasked with teaching you today is MERD formalism, which is the method that's used to calculate dose in diagnostic imaging nuclear medicine procedures and also therapeutic procedures. It's called MERD because it was originally invented in 1968 by the MERD committee. So MERD stands for uh, Medical Internal Radiation Dissymmetry. Um, 
and throughout this talk, there's going to be a few questions that I've got or exercises. So if you're able to participate, I recommend you grab a pencil and paper. Uh, or if you're watching a recording, you can pause it and do them like that. Like Eva mentioned, if you have questions, post them in the comment section if you're on YouTube or the chat if you're on Zoom. And also note down the slide number. So I've got the slide number at the bottom right hand corner of my slides. So the contents for the talk is I'm going to go through the MERD formalism, which is actually pretty straightforward. Um, and this will take us into half of, the, half of MERD, which is biokinetics. And for that, tracer kinetic modeling will come in handy. We'll also look at dose factors, and I'll introduce the quantity absorbed fraction. We'll also look at some pretty pictures of anatomical computational phantoms representing humans. I'll describe limitations of MERD, which are important to know. And we'll also look at how MERD can be applied in the cellular or at the cellular level. So in internal radiation dissymmetry, the basic aim is to calculate absorbed dose to organs um, from the administration of an unsealed radioactive source. So if you think about how you might approach this problem, there's a few challenges that might jump into mind. So one would be that the radionuclide can spend time in many different organs. Um, another would be that the activity or the disintegrations per second in any organ will change over time. And maybe the third would be this appreciation that a disintegration in one organ can deposit energy not only in that organ, but also in other organs. And it could do this by emission of gammas, betas, electrons, and so on. So straight away, we'll jump into it. So for this formalism, we're going to introduce this concept called a target organ. So We'll call the target organ the organ that we want to calculate the absorbed dose for. We'll call that H. Uh, and then all the other organs and all organs that the radionuclide spend some time in, we'll call those source organs. And so our job is to consider the dose to the target organ, H, from disintegrations in a source organ, S. So what we'll do is we'll define a dose factor. And we write it like this, DF. So the dose factor for the target organ H from disintegrations in S is the mean dose to the target organ H per disintegration in source organ S. We'll then write the number of disintegrations in the source organ as NS. And simply we find the dose to the target organ H being equal to this product of the number of disintegrations in the source organ and the dose factor for a given target organ H from the source organ S. And then we simply sum over all of the source organs. So this is just calculating the dose of the target organ from one source organ, uh, and then from another source organ and adding them up. We should also note that the target organ, H, can also be a source organ for itself in general. And so this is the mode formalism. And I've just noticed we've had someone accidentally write on the slide. My apologies, uh, Dr. Jake. Uh, could That's you, okay. uh, from the top, if you can just change, uh, disable the an annotate. Uh, ah, yeah. sure. Okay. Clear. Oh, yeah. Disable annotation from others. Yeah, okay, I've selected that. But I'm not sure how to remove the existing annotation though. Clear, clear all drawings. Okay, all good. I think we're good. Okay, all right. No problem. So straight away, we're going to do an example calculation because this is a workshop and I feel like you guys would benefit from doing some hands on stuff. So I've made up a radio pharmaceutical. Um, so just a toy radio pharmaceutical. This particular one only spends time in three organs, the liver, the brain, and the blood. And I've listed for you the biokinetic data, so the total number of disintegrations in each of these organs. Um, so that's listed in the top table. And, uh, and I've also given you the dose factor values. So these are those values that are Absorbed dose in the target organ per disintegration in the source organ. 
Um, so the way you see these dose, this dose factor values presented is typically in a table like this one. So here we've got the target organs listed as rows and then the source organs listed as columns. And the units here again are milligrade per decay. So for example, this value in the dose factor table corresponds to the dose factor for the target organ brain per disintegration in the source organ liver. So for example, the, it's two times 10 to the minus seven milligray um, absorbed dose to the brain per disintegration in the liver. So what I'd like you to do is to calculate uh, the absorbed dose to the brain. So maybe just think about how you would do that. And if you've, again, if you're on YouTube or you're looking at a recording, sorry, um, pause it and have a go. So this is the answer down here. So we look at the three different source organs, including the brain itself. And again, it's just a simple multi multiplication between the number of disintegrations in the source organ by the dose factor um, for the target organ from that source organ. Let's look a little bit more into the biokinetic data. So this is the, the number of decays or the number of disintegrations in the source organ. So how do we get that value in practice? So for this, I'd like to introduce this, um, this quantity called the time activity curve or the TAC. So the time activity curve for a source organ S, we'll call it just AS, uh, and it's a function of time. And in general, this time activity curve has an uptake region where the activity is increasing in the organ, and it's got a retention region where the activity then decreases in the organ. Um, so since activity is decays per second, um, or decays per unit time in general, uh, if we then integrate over time the activity, what we get is the number of decays. And if we integrate the time activity curve from time zero, which we'll call the time of administration of the rate of pharmaceutical, all the way to infinity, um, then we get this quantity called the cumulated activity. And this is denoted by the AS with a tilde on top of the A. Um, so for example, in this plot on the right, we have activity in becquerels, so decays per second, and time is in seconds. So the cumulated activity in this case will be the number of decays. But in general, you might see these time activity curves presented with different units. So the activity could be in megabecquerels, for example, and the time could be in hours. So in that case, your accumulated activity would have units of megabecquerel hours. But what's important to note is that accumulated activity is just equal to the number of disintegrations in the source organ, um, up to some choice of units. So this is really a dimensionless quantity even though you can see it given with units. The next quantity I want to introduce to you has a, some negative connotations to it, but it is still used today. And the reason it has some negative connotations is because it's a common source of confusion for people um, in this area. So this is the residence time. So I want you to consider that green rectangle on the figure. Um, which has height equal to A0, which is the administered activity. So the residence time for the source organ is simply the width of this rectangle, such that the area of the rectangle is equal to the area under the time activity curve or the accumulated activity. That's, that's all this is. Um, typically, this has units of hours. It will be quoted in units of hours. And like I said, because people don't like using the term residence time, it's now sometimes called the time integrated activity coefficient. But all it, all it is really is this constant of proportionality between the accumulated activity and the administered activity. So the residence time is defined as the accumulated activity in the source organ divided by the administered activity. So it's important to note that that is the administered activity A0 and not the initial activity in the source organ. If you go and look at some publications with in internal radiation dissymmetry, you can see this MERD formalism written a couple of different ways. So the way that I've presented it to you so far is actually called the, the radar, um, the radar way of writing things. And radar stands for a radiation dose assessment resource. So that's their own group. And so this is the formalism in which we talk about the number of disintegrations and multiplying that by a dose factor, which is in units of milligray per disintegration. The original way that the MERD formalism was presented is actually in 
using the uh, accumulated activity uh, and, and this S factor. So instead of writing the dose factor, they had a, they called it the S factor. And the only difference really is that the accumulated activity usually has units, say megabecquerel hours. And then, so the S factors are presented in units of milligray per megabecquerel hours, say. So this is a little bit more practical if you're using MERD practically, um, but it's, it doesn't really convey the underlying meaning as well as the radar way. And in the MERD formalism, they can also write the MERD formalism in terms of the residence time in the source organ and the administered activity, and that's shown there as well. But importantly, these are just the same thing. Now, since this talk has diagnostic imaging in its name, I feel like I can't pass up this opportunity to talk about um, how we determine risk of detriment from stochastic effects in diagnostic imaging. So the MERD formalism will give us organ absorbed doses, and we'd like to go and predict the risk of detriment from stochastic effects from those organ absorbed doses. That's the aim. And by stochastic effects here, we're talking about cancer, so the induction of cancer, and we're also talking about genetic effects that may occur from gonadal exposures. So again, if you think about how we might go about this problem, there's a few things you'd consider, but certainly one of them would be the type of radiation that deposited the energy. And you might also consider which organs or tissues were irradiated. So as you've heard from previous speakers during this workshop, the absorbed dose isn't the only thing that matters if you're looking at uh, radiobiological effectiveness. It also matters how the absorbed dose was deposited. And so what I'm thinking here along the lines of LET. Um, so for this, we have this quantity called the equivalent dose. And the equivalent dose is defined for a particular organ. Uh, the equivalent dose to an organ is defined as the product of the absorbed dose to the organ from a particular radiation type R multiplied by the radiation weighting factor for that radiation type, and then summing over all of the radiation uh, types that deposited dose. Um, so this equivalent dose has units of sieverts instead of gray. And so these radiation weighting factors have units of sieverts per gray. And these radiation weighting factors, you can generally think of them as increasing with increasing LET of the radiation type. So for example, for photons and electrons, we take them to be one. For protons, we take it to be two. For alphas, 20. And for neutrons, we use a continuous function of energy. So I've got a quick example calculation there. Uh, if you had the, a liver receiving two gray from x-rays and three gray from protons, then the equivalent dose to the liver would be eight sieverts. So the next thing we want to take into account is that different, um, different organs, uh, if they're irradiated with the same equivalent dose, then it might not confer the same risk of detriment from stochastic effects, depending on which organ received that equivalent dose. So for this, we have this quantity called effective dose. And the effective dose is only defined for the whole body. And we, we obtain the effective dose by multiplying our equivalent dose to some organ or tissue T by the tissue weighting factor that tissue and then summing over all of the tissues that received an equivalent dose. Unfortunately the effective dose also has units of sieverts so it can be a little bit confusing if you see a quantity in sieverts out of context. We have this property that the tissue weighting factor they, they sum to one for all of the tissues in the body um, but importantly the effective dose to the whole body by design oh sorry I should mention the tissue weighting factors uh, they're larger for tissues that are either more radiosensitive, so perhaps cancer is more likely to be induced in that tissue from an exposure or from a given equivalent dose. Um, but they're also higher if the prognosis with a cancer from that tissue is worse, or if the quality of life living with a cancer from that tissue is worse. So um, by construction, the effective dose is actually proportional to a population-based risk of detriment from stochastic time. effects. All users can now please log off for 60 Sorry, I'll just pause for a second. And log on again to commence use of Sunrise EMR. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, the effective dose is proportional to a population-based risk of detriment from stochastic effects. Uh, 
Having said that, we can still use the effective dose to predict a risk of fatal cancer. So we, we go roughly, it's about 5% risk of fatal cancer per sievert of effective dose. And this kind of risk coefficient or this risk model actually comes from data from the atomic bomb survivors. Uh, and that data is actually only above about 100 millisieverts. Um, and the extension of this risk model of 5% per sieverts to below 100 millisieverts um, is called the linear no threshold model. But it's important to stress that um, this risk coefficient of about 5% per sievert of effective dose is a population-based risk. It's not actually the risk to any individual, any particular individual. So back to MERD, what is there to do now that we have our formalism? So we really have two separate jobs. One of them is to obtain a description of the time activity curve that we can then integrate over time to obtain our accumulated activity, our total number of disintegrations. And the second job we have to do is obtain these dose factors. So this mean absorbed dose to a target organ H per disintegration in a source organ S. Um, so that's our two separate jobs. So we start with the biokinetics, the first one. And because I'm not sure about um, background of some of the viewers, I'm gonna talk about effective half-life just quickly. So you might've got this, um, you might have this perception that if you have activity in a source organ, um, it's, it's removed not only from physical decay, but also from biological processes. Um, so, and what we do is we assume that the biological clearance is also exponential um, and it has a half-life equal to, um, or we denote the half-life by T for bi B for biology or biological and S for this, whatever the source organ is. Um, and we can give it a decay constant as well, just from the exponential. And then we have to appreciate that the activity in the source organ will reduce due to both biological clearance and physical decay. And because of that, we have this effective decay constant. So in, the, in this event of two exponential processes happening at the same time, the, it's the decay constants which add. So we have an effective decay constant, which is the sum of the physical decay constant and the biological decay constant. And we can also um, define this effective half-life the normal way for an, for an exponential. And we also note that in this case where biological clearance is very slow or you have a long half-life for biological clearance, um, then the effective half-life is just essentially the physical half-life, which makes sense. So I've got another example problem. We've got a female patient who receives an intravenous administration of 500 megabecquerels of a technesium 99M labeled radiopharmaceutical. 30% is taken up by the liver and 70% by the kidneys. The uptake is rapid and there's negligible uptake in any other organ. We have the clearance from the tissues taking place with a biological half-life of 12 hours. And there's no biological elimination from the liver. So we've got two jobs. One would be to calculate the effective half-life in each of the above organs. The second would be to then calculate the accumulated activity in each of the above organs. So the kidneys and the liver. Pause it if you're watching a recording and have a go. So the first thing to note is because uptake is rapid, we'll have no uptake region in either of the time activity curves for the organs. So the time activity curve will simply be exponential with some effective half-life. We we'll use that equation presented in the previous slide to calculate our effective half-life. And we can simply write the time activity curve in this kind of fashion, where with the initial activity in the organ, we can get that from the, those uptake values. And then all we have to do to get the accumulated activity is to integrate over an exponential, which is quite straightforward, and we get a nice, a nice answer. Uh, so it's not always easy to measure a time activity curve for some tissues or some organs. So some tissues and or some parts of any system, especially biological systems, aren't easily accessible by measurement. So for example, you could obtain activity measurements or activity concentration measurements for blood by taking blood samples. Uh, for certain organs, you could obtain activity measurements for the organ by doing quantitative imaging. But it's not clear to me, at least, um, how you would, in an image, 
distinguish between activity that's in the wall of an organ versus in the contents of an organ. So example organs for this would be like bladder, heart, stomach, intestine, gallbladder. Similarly, how would you distinguish between activity that's in the bone matrix or in the bone surfaces on an image? So this is really the motivation for these tracer kinetic models. It's that we want to make measurements in the accessible portion of our system. And then we use our tracer kinetic model to estimate parameters for inaccessible features of our system. So in compartment models, um, we have the, obviously we have this term called compartment. So what are compartments? They're volumes or spaces in which a tracer concentration will rapidly become uniform. So for us, we're going to be considering compartments to be organs or tissues. Let's denote the concentration of a tracer in a compartment A um, with CA as a function of time T. We're going to define the flux or the flow to be the tracer concentration that's moving from one compartment to another per unit time. And generally, we'll just consider what's called first order kinetics. And in first order kinetics, we have the flux that leaves a compartment being proportional to the instantaneous concentration in that compartment. So for example, the flux leaving compartment A will just be proportional to the concentration in compartment A at that time. Or if you like the flow from compartment A to compartment B is only proportional to the concentration in compartment A. So I've got an example of a model on the right. This is a, just a two compartment model, compartment A and compartment B. And we can write down this equation for the time rate of change of the concentration in compartment A. And it's just going to be equal to the flow from B to A minus the flow from A to B. So what's flowing into A minus what's flowing out of A will be the concentration in A per unit time. So like I said, the flow from B to A will only be proportional to the concentration in compartment B. So that's what we've written down there. And then the flow from A to B will only be proportional to the concentration in compartment A. And so this equation here, and or that picture even, is what we call a tracer kinetic model. So these K1 and K2, they're called rate constants. Um, they're simply the, in this case, the fraction of the compartment's concentration that's leaving the compartment per unit time. And if instead of considering concentration, we were to write this equation in terms of activity, what we would need to do is add one extra term, which to account for physical decay. Uh, and of course, that's going to just be proportional to the activity in that particular compartment. So our next exercise, I've got another compartment model. This is a three compartment model. I'd like you to write down the time rate of change in the concentration of compartment B. Um, again, pause it if you're watching a recording. It, look, it might look hard, but it's actually not very hard. So all we have to do is um, consider the flow from A to B. That's going to be going into B. And then we have to subtract off the stuff that's flowing out of B. So we subtract off the flow from B to A, and we subtract off the flow from B to C. So that's what it looks like. That's the equation. Now, these tracer kinetic models can get very complicated if you're looking at real biological systems. And they can get very large. So for example, this is the compartment model for iodine. However, in general, the tracer kinetic model, it's actually usually very easy to write down if you're considering first order kinetics. So for example, the general equation is shown there. So the time rate of change, the activity in the compartment I um, can be written like that. And the very first term is the activity flowing out of compartment I. The second term is physical decay. And then the summation and all of the other terms are activity that is flowing into compartment I from compartment J. So even though these equations can look very complicated, um, the good news is that under certain constraints, the solution is actually pretty straightforward. In particular, if we assume immediate uptake in the source organ S, then we can write the time activity curve, um, or in this case, the time activity curve divided by the administered activity as a sum of exponentials. So here we've got, again, A0 is the administered activity. Fs is the fractional distribution to the source organ S. And then for each of these exponentials, we have the parameter Ai, which is like the fraction of Fs that gets eliminated 
with an effective rate constant, lambda EI. Um, and interestingly, uh, these AI parameters can be negative because essentially what you're doing at this point is curve fitting to your data. Um, but importantly, they all sum to one. So now that we have a time activity curve, we have an expression for a time activity curve, we can just integrate this from time zero to infinity to get our accumulated activity. Or in this case, we'll get our residence time because we divided by the administered activity. And we have a very straightforward equation for our residence time in the source organ S. ICRP 128 is a very useful document for looking up doses from nuclear medicine diagnostic imaging procedures. And the cool thing about ICRP 128 is they actually give you the information about the biokinetic models that they're using in their dose calculations. So the biokinetic information is presented in tables like the one shown here. Um, so th this is the table for FDG, for example. And the column on the, the first column on the left is the source organ, S. The uh, columns two through to four uh, are these parameters that I showed you in the last slide. So these parameters are the ones that describe the time activity curve in the source organ S, and they're the ones that are used to calculate the residence time, like I showed. And that last column is the residence time in the source organ S. But what most people in practice do when they use ICRP-128 is they just look at these tables. So these tables give you absorbed dose in a particular organ uh, per unit of administered activity. They also give you the effective dose per unit of administered activity. So that's one half of MERD. The other half is these dose factors. So recall the dose factor um, is the mean dose to a target organ H per disintegration in source organ S. So how would we actually measure a dose factor? So the first step is to consider each emission, we'll call them I, from the radionuclide separately. So by emissions, I'm talking about, for example, the gamma that results from a transition between two daughter energy levels, or the beta for a decay to a particular daughter energy level. Those would be separate emissions. And for each of these emissions, we're going to define an absorbed fraction, phi, again, um, as the fraction of energy emitted from the ith emission in source organ S that is absorbed in target organ H. So then if we just take the product of our fraction of energy emitted in the source organ S that is absorbed in target organ H, and we multiply that by the energy that was emitted per disintegration due to the ith emission, um, then we get the total energy that gets absorbed in our source organ H uh, per disintegration. So then we just need to divide by the mass of the organ H, the target organ H, and we get the dose to the organ H per disintegration um, in source organ S after we sum over all of those emissions. So this equation can look a bit complicated, um, but if you stare at it long enough, it should make sense. Oh, so yes, yeah, the energy emitted per disintegration due to the ith emission is simply the, the product of the yield, so the number of emissions per disintegration, and the average energy of the ith emission. So in practice, these absorbed fractions for a given source organ S are actually typically presented in tables with target organs as rows, like shown below. Um, and instead of doing it for each emission, they actually just at least in the old days, they gave it in terms of discrete photon energies and let you sort of interpolate between them to get your gamma emissions. We also have this general kind of approximation that for photons that are very low energy, like less than 10 kV, also for electrons, for betas and for alphas, we can assume that the source organ is the organ where all of the energy is deposited. So. This absorbed fraction is one if the target organ is equal to the source organ, and it's zero if for other organs. And the absorbed fraction has this cool property where you can calculate the inverse, or the inverse is equal to itself. Um, so the absorbed fraction for some emission for a given source organ um, and target organ combination is the same if you switch the target organ and the source organ. This gives us a nice relationship between the inverses for the dose factor as well just being related by the, the uh, ratio of the masses. 
And if and you'll also see a quantity called the specific absorbed fraction, which is just the absorbed fraction divided by the target organ mass. And you can see, also see the dose factor equation written in terms of the specific absorbed fraction uh, like that. So in order to actually measure an absorbed fraction and hence a dose factor, we need to actually do Monte Carlo simulations. So one of the things these simulations has to have is a, a phantom that represents the anatomy of a human being. And basically, basically the procedure for measuring a, an absorbed fraction or a specific absorbed fraction would be like shown here. So firstly, we assume all the disintegrations are uniformly distributed in a source organ. And then we would just simulate N emissions of type I in that source organ. And then we'd score the total energy that gets deposited in some target organ H. And then the specific absorbed fraction for the target organ H from the emissions in the source organ S would be given by this ratio. So it's that total energy deposited. Um, we'll divide by those number of emissions that we did. So that's like total energy deposited per emission. If we multiply by the yield for the ith emission, that will give us the total energy absorbed um, per decay. Um, then we need to divide by the energy of the emission, uh, emission EI, and that'll give us the absorbed fraction. And then we divide by the mass of the target organ and that'll give us the specific absorbed fraction. So there are two components um, to these Monte Carlo simulations that I'm gonna talk about. The first will be the track structure. So the Monte Carlo track structure, there's a few considerations that you can um, consider. The first would be whether you're gonna use condensed history processes to simulate your tracks or whether you do step-by-step -step tracking. So condensed history processes, that's where you um, look at a cumulative effect of multiple electron collisions uh, in a single step, whereas step-by-step -step or event-by-event -event tracking is where you consider each event uh, explicitly. So for example, that figure on the right, Livermore physics is an example of condensed history processes and GM4 DNA physics is an example of step-by-step -step tracking. Important to note here though, is the scale of the figures. So this is across 15 nanometers. So step-by-step, Tracking is really only appropriate in the microdissymmetry domain or at the most um, inside of a cell, the cellular level. Um, for us, for our purposes, for the Monte Carlo track structure simulations for macrodissymmetry, like in MERD, we probably don't need that. Condensed history is probably okay. Another thing in Monte Carlo track structure to consider is these interaction cross sections. So, we're talking about probability for events like electron ionizations, excitations, Bremsstrahlung, and all the gamma processes. The other thing is the cutoff energy. So uh, how far down do you track these electrons? So uh, at what energy do you stop tracking and do you just dump all the energy of the electron where it stands? And there are lots of examples of Monte Carlo track structure code. I've listed some of them there and some of them specialize in certain energy domains, whereas others are quite general purpose. But I think the cooler thing about these Monte Carlo simulations is actually the, the phantoms, so the um, geometry side of things. The first ever dose factors were calculated for these stylized phantoms by Schneider et al. in about 1975. And these phantoms use what's called uh, geometric primitives, uh, which basically just means all the shapes you're familiar with, like cones, spheres, ellipsoids, um, cylinders, things like that. And they, to get their organ sizes and shapes and so on, they used information from ICRP 23, which is a report on the reference man. So they gave organ sizes for the average adult worker of the Western hemisphere. So yeah, Schneider simulated that. And that was the first ever phantom for which dose factors were calculated. It's also called the Merd phantom. Much later, more than 10 years later, we had Christine Ackerman um, extend the MERD phantom to a series of pediatric phantoms as well. So uh, 
uh, he did phantoms for a newborn, a one-year-old, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 15-year-old. Um, and these phantoms are actually hermaphrodites, so they have both male and female sex organs for the purposes of calculating dose factors. And interestingly, it was practice back then was to use the 15-year-old as a surrogate for the adult female. And I think most notably is the values in ICRP 128, those dose values that we saw in the, in the table, they're actually calculated using these phantoms. So it wasn't until 1995 that we finally got a dedicated purpose-built female adult phantom. And that was by Staben et al. So that finally came in 1995. And we also got three um, pregnant phantoms. So one three-month pregnant, a six-month pregnant, and a nine-month pregnant phantom. These were very important for doing dissymmetry um, for calculating fetal doses from in utero exposures. In the last 20 years though, we've had a different kind of phantom. So all of those phantoms were based on the geometric primitives, but in the last 20 years, we've had what, a new generation of phantoms called boundary representation phantoms. There's really two types. Um, one is non-uniform rational basis spine or NURBS phantoms, and the other is polygonal meshes, um, but collectively we'll just call them boundary representation phantoms. In 2001, Sega's produced the first ever boundary representation phantom, and this is uh, this was NURBS based. And this is the cardiac torso phantom, or the, the NCAT phantom. And one of the, the coolest things about the boundary representation phantoms is that is the shapes in them are very easy to deform. So in particular, he made a 4D phantom. So he made a phantom that can produce cardiac and respiratory motions. This does have limitations though, so it's a torso only, it's a male only, um, and because it was purpose for nuclear medicine, the structure is actually quite low resolution. About 10 years later, he reduced an extension on his NCAT phantom, the XCAT phantom. And this phantom is much more higher resolution. So for example, the brain alone has more than 100 vessels and structures, and it's also a whole body phantom. He also released uh, phantoms for lots of different BMIs, ages, uh, and so on. So it's not just a single phantom. But the first dose factors produced for a boundary representation phantom was produced by Staben et al. in 2012. He used the NURBS phantom from SAGARS, um, and, but he used the size data from a new ICRP report, ICRP 89. And he's produced dose factors for adult male, adult female, pediatrics, and pregnant women. These phantoms are pretty impressive. So now let's talk about some limitations of MERD. So I've put up the equation for the MERD formalism again for your reference. And let's look at the two separate components, the biokinetics components and the dose factor components. We'll look at those separately. So the dose factor, so that absorbed dose in target organ H per disintegration in source organ S. Um, let's look at some of the quantities that are in that. So first we have those average energies and yields of the emissions. Um, that comes from nuclear decay data. And the uncertainty in that is pretty small relatively. So that, that's okay. That's not a great source of um, uncertainty for us. Um, the absorbed fractions or the specific absorbed fractions um, and the organ masses. It's important to note that these values are always for a reference phantom. So regardless of how realistic the phantom is, even if it's a really cool boundary representation phantom, um, that phantom will not match most patients in general. You also saw when we walked through the Monte Carlo simulation that we have to assume that disintegrations are spatially uniform in the source organ, which again, isn't, isn't a, uh, what happens in reality. So there's a couple of limitations. Uh, on the biokinetic side of things, um, we can break our total number of disintegrations in a source organ. We can break that down into the administered activity and the residence time. So the administered activity, we measure that in a dose calibrator and if you've got a good QC program for your dose calibrator or QA program for your dose calibrator, the uncertainty in that is usually not too bad. Uh, but the residence time, on the other hand, if you're using, uh, for example, ICRP 128's tables, dose tables, um, all of those residence times come from compartment models. Um, and the model parameters are often estimated from animal studies, not even from human studies. But even if they were from human studies, we still have to appreciate that the there's a large variation in biokinetics between individual patients. 
So that's a very large error or a very large um, uncertainty in that in that particular quantity. So we have this great quote from ICRP 128 itself that says, estimates from, of absorbed dose to different organs will not generally deviate from actual absorbed doses in patients by more than a factor of three. And the effective dose may vary within a factor of two. So that's the kind of uncertainties that we, we're dealing with in nuclear medicine. I've got a couple of plots here that are showing time activity curves for two different organs, um, urinary bladder and gallbladder. Uh, this comes from a, a paper from 2009, but you can just see, especially for gallbladder, uh, how much between different patients, how much variation there is in the time activity curve and ultimately the residence time in that organ. So this is the, the major source of error for us. And just finally, I'll show you briefly MERD in the microbiosymmetry context. So for this whole talk, we've been talking about tissues and organs as being the sources and the targets. Um, we can just equally apply this formalism in the cellular domain. So we can consider cells to be, yep, one minute, Eva, last slide. We can consider cells to be the target or the source, the whole cell, or we can even consider components of the cell to be source or target regions. So typically in this microdosimetry, we would do a multicellular geometry and the biokinetic data is similar, except you know, instead of accumulated activity in an organ, we're considering it in the cell or in a cellular component. Um, this is typically done by sampling from a distribution. And for the residence time, instead of defining it in terms of the administered activity, we would do the initial activity in the cell. And interestingly, these cellular, the dose factors in the cellular context, they separate the dose factor into a self-dose and to a cross-dose. So self-dose is the dose factor for um, disintegrations in the same cell, um, whereas cross-dose would be a dose factor for disintegrations in a different cell. And the reason this is done is because the dose from disintegrations in the same cell versus in other cells um, can be um, deposited with different LET values. Um, so if you're importing your symmetry into a radiobiological model, um, you might want to have those two components separated and treat them separately. So some examples are MERD cell um, and paradigm. MERD cell is shown there. So just to conclude, the MERD formalism is very powerful. It's very elegant and a general method for calculating dose from radionuclides in biological systems. Um, the biokinetics and the physics, or the dose factors, are treated separately and they're completely independent. I think that's why it's elegant. Um, we have these tracer kinetic models or compartment models, which we can use to derive biokinetic data, which we can't access by measurements. And we do Monte Carlo simulations with anatomical phantoms to obtain the dose factors. So this is the method used to estimate dose from diagnostic nuclear medicine procedures. And we like to use those tables from ICRP 121 or 128. Um, but we have to appreciate that dose calculated in this way, um, dose received by an individual uh, may differ considerably from the ICRP 128 tables, owing to patient divergence from, divergence from the reference phantom geometry and also the reference biokinetic data. So thank you very much. Your, uh, yes, your test. Paul, My test? Jake, yes, Hold next on. slide. Uh, do we have that to put up in Zoom? Okay, yes, but also put it on your, oh, okay. uh, do next slide, please. Yeah, so that people on YouTube can see as well. Okay. okay. Can everybody see the poll up into their screen? Yes. Okay, we can stop polling question one. Okay, so the correct time was residence time. Jake, yeah. can you explain one? Yeah, so the majority got it right. So the residence time is the accumulated activity, or sorry, the residence time is the total number of disintegrations divided by the administered activity. Whereas the area under the time activity curve and the accumulated activity, they're both equal to the total number of disintegrations. Yeah, yeah. If you have the correct units. Next question. I thought we have one more. Is that the mm. only one that we've got there? Okay, Let's here we that. are. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
uh, oh, so I think the um, it didn't come through very well. Yes, can you read it for us? <laughs> the second one should be zero to the energy of the emission. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like that some people put that as their answer there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we can see the slide. So on the slide, we can uh, see the right wording behind oh, it. Oh, true, true, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we can end polling. Good, the majority got it, just. Yes. So the absorbed fraction can be as little as zero, but it can't be any more than one. Because it's a fraction of 100%, yes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much, Jake. Uh, people are asking whether the PowerPoint presentation will be shareable. Chai Hong, can you confirm that the videos will be uploaded? Yes, Eva, the video yes, will be uploaded will. to YouTube. Yes, so people will be sent the link to watch the presentations again in YouTube. Uh, thank you, Jake, for an excellent presentation. And considering that it was really mathematically full on, I think everyone will benefit from watching the lecture for the second time to digest all the, all the mathematics that you have described, though. Uh, so clearly and pedagogically. So without much ado, I will jump to the next lecture. As I said, we will be uh, doing question and answers at the end. I would one more time uh, like to ask you to turn off your audio and video, not to block the bandwidth too much. I mentioned that we will have a recording on YouTube. Please pose your questions and comments in the chat box on Zoom or YouTube. And finally, please fill in the feedback form at the end of the workshop to receive your certificate. So again, uh, it is my pleasure to present the last speaker in this series, Professor of Medical Physics, uh, Loredana Marcou uh, from the University of Oradea who is also an adjunct professor at the School of Health Sciences, University of South Australia. Uh, she has worked and studied in Adelaide, South Australia, and is a very close colleague and fantastic collaborator of mine. Her research interests cover in silico modeling, uh, tumor response to treatment, radiation biology targeted therapies, risk of second cancer and others and she has published over 100 scientific papers. She is also very active in the activities of the European Federation of Organization for Medical Physics and the International Union of Physical and Engineering Scientists in Medicine. So without many more words, Loredana, the floor is yours. Would you be able to share your screen with us? I'm doing it now. Thank you so much, Eva, for uh, this nice introduction. And uh, hopefully soon you'll be able to. Yes, we can screen. see your presentation. Perfect. Yes. Ready to go. That's great. Thank you. Um, it is definitely my privilege to deliver this last talk of uh, the series, series of uh, lectures on radiobiology in the era of precision medicine. Um, watching uh, Jake's uh, previous lecture, I just like to make a mention here for you to know what's coming. Mine uh, will be slightly different uh, with less uh, uh, mathematical approach and more like a story of um, radiobiology from uh, basic science to clinical implementation through biomarkers, uh, which, um, as I said, they will be strongly linked to the current knowledge uh, in uh, radiobiology. Radiobiology is uh, developing greatly. It is a wonderful area to study, not just for radiobiologists or for clinic uh, uh, clinicians, but also for uh, medical physicists. Uh, I consider uh, myself being a medical physicist, I consider that uh, it is uh, critical for um, 
a complex medical physicist to have um, a really good knowledge on radiobiology to understand how radiation acts, to understand why uh, do we call radiobiology the science behind the radiotherapy, and why is it so important to consider all the radiobiological developments when we would like to implement a new treatment, to implement um, a new radiation schedule or uh, different uh, combinations of uh, novel approaches. The exercise I'm giving you uh, is my request to pay attention and to try to uh, get in all the information that will be quite various. And uh, I guess uh, some of these uh, things will be uh, new for you because I try to focus not only on the historical perspective and developments of certain biomarkers, but also on uh, what is currently uh, happening in clinics and hopefully what will happen in the future. So what the future brings in this large area of applied radiobiology in radiotherapy. So I invite you to um, get uh, process this information and I will be more than happy to answer to your questions uh, after this lecture. I was very happy to see the um, general title of uh, the series of these lectures being on radiobiology in the era of uh, precision uh, medicine. I'm sure you all heard uh, from the literature or from other talks and conferences about precision medicine, uh, as well as about personalized therapy. These two words are omnipresent terms in today's scientific literature. And while they are often used as, as synonyms, these terms can be further refined in their definition in order to highlight their distinctive meaning. Uh, so I... Uh, try in um, the next slide to actually highlight uh, what the two terms mean and uh, where do we see the difference between them. Precision medicine refers to any medical practice that is tailored to a subgroup of patients. So here the key word would be the subgroup of patients that are based on uh, the group is based on similar genetic or epigenetic features, epigenetic meaning uh, everything from their lifestyle to um, uh, other habits, or why not image characteristics. Now, you might um, uh, know from your general knowledge or interest in clinical trials that uh, this aspect is also called patient stratification. So precision medicine leads to patient stratification in uh, medical studies, in clinical trials, in order to uh, form subgroups of patients with the similar uh, or very similar characteristics, so they can be treated differently as subgroups. But to take a step further, we have personalized therapy. Personalized, uh, personalized therapy, it's, as I said, it's, it is a step further because here we are looking at the individual, at the unique person. And the aim of personalized therapy is to target the individual rather than the subgroup of patients. And this approach obviously requires next to imaging, patient-based information, including all the omics uh, components that you might be aware of, but I will also mention them uh, in uh, uh, my presentation, and also the clinical data, the patient history, different uh, blood markers, or all the characteristics that led to the current stage. So the uh, fine difference between precision medic medicine and personalized therapy is that the first one refers to a subgroup of patients, which is more commonly um, uh, handled or managed in today's radiotherapy, while personalized therapy, which should be the future aim, if not the current one, of radiotherapy aims to target the individual, because obviously we are all different, as um, you well know, and uh, why not we are different in our response response to different drugs, to radiation, and so on. 
Therefore, personalized therapy, as you can see in, uh, in my chart, incorporates the omics elements uh, of precision medicine through assessment of genes, of um, proteins, of uh, transcription factors, of uh, metabolites, as well as other factors that are related to biological adaptation of treatment planning, which I'm sure you are aware of how important that is. Why not the management of organ motion, which is again patient tailored and uh, depends on the individual uh, adaptation of the treatment itself based on various anatomical and functional changes that can be picked up from uh, imaging techniques. Or, and I left this as the, the last idea, the uh, quantitative assessment of images, what we now call radiomics. And no doubt radiomics is one of the uh, latest uh, sub-disciplines of, um, of imaging that deals with um, uh, the evaluation, the quantitative evaluation of all the information that are not seen by the naked eye. So uh, uh, something that needs uh, deep learning, machine learning, or if you want to put all these under a bigger umbrella, needs artificial intelligence, uh, to help us in getting more in-depth information based on CT, PET, MR, so on, images in order to create some models that can predict the patient's response to therapy. And this would be ultimately what uh, um, personalized, personalized therapy means. But uh, back to radiobiology. We know from uh, all the basic uh, radiobiological information that tumor microenvironment is strongly uh, patient specific, which therefore requires personalized therapy. In order to do this, one needs to identify uh, both tumor and patient specific characteristics to be able to predict response to therapy. What I'm going to talk uh, about in uh, today's um, uh, presentation are two plus one main aspects. The two uh, biggest aspects that I would like to point out, what you see here in balance is what we well know as the, the compromise in radiation tumor control versus normal tissue protection or normal tissue complications. Despite the, the, the latest advances in radiobiology and radiotherapy, also imaging, we don't have the perfect treatment. We cannot uh, deliver 100% of the uh, dose to the tumor and completely uh, spare the normal tissue, though this would be the ideal scenario. Also, we don't have an imaging uh, device that would um, allow uh, such a great resolution that we could perhaps image each and every single cell and differentiate between tumor cells and normal cells so we can have the optimal delineation of the PTV or CTV and we know exactly where to deliver the dose in order to eradicate all cancerous cells and to spare the normal tissue. Therefore, when we talk about personalized treatment, we have to take into account these two aspects. Personalized treatment from a tumor control perspective and personalized treatment from a normal tissue um, protection perspective, because patients have different radio sensitivities when it comes to tumor and to normal tissue. So it is important to develop some uh, biomarkers that could give us indications on both these aspects. And I said two plus one. The plus one is linked to gender-specific radiotherapy, which I guess will be a new um, information for most of you, because though we know this since the beginning of the earth, that there are different genders, and it is well known from different drug trials that uh, females and males respond differently to the effect of even the, the most uh, uh, simple drug or the, the most common drugs like aspirin, for example, still there are no studies or not enough studies in radiotherapy 
that would make a difference between genders. However, there are studies and there are proofs of the fact that different genders respond differently to radiation, both when we take into account tumor control and normal tissue protection. So these will be the main aspects that I will um, cover in today's um, presentation. This table might be familiar to some of you because the information, while it has been processed and, and published by our group in other journals, uh, the basic information uh, can be found in nearly all radiobiology books. Eric Hall, who wrote the Bible of radiobiology, is well known to, to started um, discussing the issues of predictive essays. Now, I'm not spending a lot of time to discuss these predictive essays that you see in this table, reason being that they have not made it to clinics or most of them have not. However, I would like to point out the, the, the starting point of these uh, essays and, and uh, to lead you into the need for personalized treatment, um, showing the fact that decades ago, researchers actually knew that we respond differently to radiation and it would be really important to develop some ways of um, um, like making the difference between uh, uh, the way different people respond. So we had uh, uh, three predictive essays, three categories for predictive essays developed in basic radiobiology. And those were looking at the oxygenation status, the proliferative potential of tumors, and also the intrinsic radio resistance. And I uh, put there, um, like a heading with a question mark, maybe the subpopulation of cancer stem cells, which is not included in the older radiobiology books because we didn't know exactly whether cancer stem cells exist in this form or we can call them actually like that. So the oxygenation status, uh, the proliferative essays for, for evaluating the oxygenation fraction or at least um, uh, the qualitative presence of oxygenation was to identify those patient groups that would benefit from hypoxic cell sensitizers. We know that hypoxia, it is a real challenge in radiotherapy. Therefore, it would have been and it would be um, in the future as well, uh, an absolutely great tool to be able to evaluate, to quantify hypoxia and not just to quantify it, but take the hypoxic content into account in order to implement it in uh, the, the further treatment administration to adjust the treatment based on this. A second predictive essay um, uh, that was um, developed uh, li was linked to the proliferative potential of tumors. Its aim was to differentiate between tumors with slow and those uh, from fast proliferation because they would need obviously a different approach. Uh, they might need a completely different fractionation regime. You might need for slow one hyperfractionation while for fast proliferation, you might need hyperfractionated radiotherapy. And for intrinsic radio resistance, the main purpose of a predictive essay would have been to correlate cell line radio sensitivity with tumor response to radiation. So the idea was to develop some essays uh, on different the cell lines originating from patients or from biopsies, from tumors, uh, to grow them, to irradiate them, to draw the surviving curves. And based on that, draw some conclusions regarding how these different cell lines that originate from patients would respond actually in vivo. Now, all these three categories of predictive essays were heavily studied. Uh, you can see the techniques in my table, but also you can see the limitations and the reason why um, these predictive essays did not make it into clinics. First of all, some of them were highly invasive to determine the oxygenation status, for instance, with the um, um, 
um, Eppendorf uh, or the, the polarograph. Others are unreliable. Um, decades ago, hypoxia assessment was done using biopsies. Biopsies are not reliable because you cannot take that many samples to make sure that you cover the whole tumor and you pick actually all those areas that could uh, possibly be hypoxic. Some of them couldn't find a robust correlation between different uh, theoretical parameters and the treatment outcomes. Or others, like uh, for instance, the survival curves uh, that, were, that were designed in order to evaluate the intrinsic radio resistance, they were highly time consuming. So because of all these reasons, we don't see actually these uh, techniques used in uh, clinics. But what we have seen, it was a rise of biomarkers. Researchers realized that actually even through the analysis of all these uh, uh, tumor characteristics, hypoxia proliferation or the fraction of cancer stem cells, we can identify them in clinical settings by certain signatures, the signature of hypoxia through, um, uh, as you can see in this uh, chart, different um, uh, markers, signature of proliferation through different proteins, enzymes, and so on. And also the um, uh, identification of cancer stem cells by using the adequate markers that would highlight the existence and hopefully would even quantify the percentage of cancer stem cells that exist within a tumor. What I'll do um, is um, uh, to keep it um, uh, more basic, uh, because my understanding was that most of you are medical physicists. I won't go into um, large uh, biological details, but I would like to talk about these three components, hypoxia proliferation and um, uh, resistance through uh, cancer stem cells. Um, to, to explain you the basics or to recap, hopefully for some of you, the basics uh, of, uh, of these issues and see why are actually they a, a problem uh, still. So what do we know about hypoxia? We know a lot about hypoxia. We know about hypoxia for over seven, if not eight decades. And still we can't properly manage hypoxia in clinical settings. We have techniques to identify hypoxia. We have some methods to, uh, to overcome at least partially hypoxia, but hypoxia keeps being the culprit for treatment recurrence or complete treatment failure. We know that there are two types of hypoxia, chronic, which is usually in the core of the tumor and the acute hypoxia. This acute hypoxia is uh, due to uh, the formation of new blood vessels, what we know as angiogenesis, that a tumor needs in order to get the nutrients and uh, the right oxygenation amount in order to grow and to survive. Now, this uh, tumor angiogenesis, it is an abnormal process, obviously. It is a very forced process within the tumor. Therefore, the blood vessels look abnormal. They have shunts, they have leakages, they have obstructions, strangulations, and so on, which won't allow the normal flow of the oxygen or of the blood. Therefore, this acute hypoxia is also known as an intermittent or a cycling hypoxia because it will appear in various regions of the tumor depending on the vasculature, depending whether there is or there is not a strangulation and obstruction that would allow blood flow in that particular area. More than that, in clinical settings, this is the greatest challenge. The greatest challenge in treatment is the cycling hypoxia due to its unpredictability. We don't know where, we don't know uh, for how long, uh, in uh, uh, what exactly, like spatially or temporally, there are lots of question marks as to where and for how long this type of hypoxia will persist. Therefore, ideally, what we could do is to image with some um, hypoxia-specific imaging techniques and treat the patient immediately. But this is an ideal world. Yeah, we unfortunately do not live in an ideal world, so we are not doing this. And by the time the patient is getting treated, those acutely hypoxic areas would change. 
So, as I said, this is one of the greatest challenges in um, uh, today's oncology regarding hypoxia. Another image that shows uh, the added uh, challenge to hypoxia is the great fluctuation, the great differences of hypoxic uh, um, fractions from patient to patient. What you see in, uh, on the um, right-hand uh, side, the head and neck tumors uh, are a very good example to give in this regard because they are known to be hypoxic. They are one of the hardest uh, or the most challenging from a radiological perspective tumors because of hypoxia and not only. But look at the oxygen tension, how much that varies in head and neck tumors among various patients. So we are talking about um, the uh, interpatient uh, uh, variability compared to normal tissues, which are more compact. So hypoxia is more um, uh, like oxygenation is more predictable. Therefore, due to these large variations in hypoxia status among patients, not only head and neck tumors, but all uh, patients uh, uh, and all tumors that uh, tend to be hypoxic, obviously uh, we need to identify those groups that uh, suffer of severe hypoxia and uh, interfere somehow with the treatment, adjust the treatment to accommodate, you know, um, radio sensitizing agents or even cytotoxic agents that would act upon hypoxic populations. Now, um, going back uh, very shortly to the, the basics of um, radiobiology, we know that uh, in order to quantify hypoxia, the hypoxic content and how hypoxic a tumor is, the oxygen enhancement ratio has been introduced as the ratio between the dose without oxygen and the dose within the presence of oxygen for the same iso effect. So this is uh, the key word to, for the same iso effect. You see this representation uh, on the graph with the surviving fraction as a function of those surviving uh, curves for a hypoxic tumor and for an oxic, a well oxygenated tumor. And the oxygen enhancement ratio in this example, which is like a general example, uh, is about 2.8, uh, or we can say that it's uh, around three. Now, this graph, I said it's a general example, it is, but I have to specify that it's characteristic to low LET radiation, which are photons and electrons. This graph is not valid for high LET particles because for neutrons, for instance, the oxygen enhancement ratio can be close to 1.5. And for alpha particles, the oxygen enhancement ratio is one. This is what we want to see. An oxygen enhancement ratio of one means that the dose in hypoxic condition equals the dose in oxygenated condition. In other words, alpha particles have the same efficiency on hypoxic cells as well as on oxic cells. No wonder why alpha particles are used very often uh, lately in targeted therapies due to their um, uh, highly focalized radiation, due to their um, um, a short range that won't destroy the surviving healthy tissues. So why is this uh, a problem that this graph is characteristic to low LET radiation, which are photons and electrons? Well, it is a problem because just think, how do we treat patients throughout the world? Mainly with linear accelerators. For, uh, protons and carbon ions and uh, uh, targeted therapies, I would say they are still an exception. Usually the world is treating cancer patients using linear accelerators and they function in a dual mode, photons or electrons, which are both low LET. So in both situations, we are dealing with a high oxygen enhancement ratio, which would mean that for the same effect as in oxic conditions, we would need to give three times the dose to hypoxic tumors, which we can't. You just can't raise the dose from 70 to 210 grays because you would kill the patient. So 
um, you have to come up with a better solution and see how to manage hypoxia. And here we go to the development of hypoxia markers for imaging and targeting. Because as you uh, might have concluded from my previous slides is that hypoxic tumors should be treated with more aggressive radiotherapy. They are aggressive cells, therefore need an aggressive treatment. Therefore, uh, there is a, a clear requirement for accurate markers for hypoxia labeling. And ideally, we would need both quantitative and qualitative knowledge on hypoxia in order to describe the resistant subpopulation and to adjust, to adapt the treatment accordingly. Here it's, um, I would say, a well-known because I've seen it, uh, people are using it in many presentations on hypoxia. It is a, an absolutely great representation of how the acute hypoxia varies during the course of treatment. The first image shows the contour of a malignant tumor using FDG PET, while the second, Already, uh, the contour was uh, kept uh, due to the FDG, but in the patient, uh, it was injected this f mysonidazole which is a, a hypoxia-specific um, uh, radioactive agent. So in that whole uh, contour, what you would see, those two spots are the subgroups of those cells that uh, um, present with high levels of hypoxia. However, day four would show a completely different distribution of hypoxia. So back to my point when I said that ideally, when you identify those hypoxic subregions, you should treat the patient immediately rather than to wait until the hypoxic uh, content, uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively will change and then the patient, the, the treatment will be much harder to manage. Now, uh, this is a busy table. I uh, try to highlight to see the different results that, that uh, uh, researchers obtained when they try to correlate different PET tracers with um, uh, hypoxic tumor markers. And you can see that some manage to show correlations, maybe limited, but others even strong correlations between uh, well-defined like f miso uh, PET tracers and um, uh, different tumor markers for hypoxia, but others could not find correlations between these two, meaning that though the tracer was not a very good representative for the hypoxic content. The conclusion from this slide would be that Perhaps we are getting there, let's be positive, but more work is needed in this area of uh, hypoxia imaging in order to have a, a conclusive uh, uh, result and to have some clearly defined um, PET tracers that really have a good specificity um, uh, towards hypoxia. I'll start talking about the second uh, parameter uh, related to tumor response, which is proliferation. So what do we know about proliferation? Proliferation and uh, more exactly the accelerated proliferation that is shown by uh, uh, some tumors that uh, proliferate um, uh, more rapidly. So they have a fast proliferation. Again, the example would be head and neck cancer. Those would show that a few weeks after the start of treatment, they start proliferating more rapidly than before the treatment, which means that something triggered, something, uh, something happened there when the tumor started to shrink and the tumor naturally starts to respond to that effect. There were several mechanisms that were identified to be responsible for this regrowth after the treatment. And you see in this table a few of them, but you also notice that these uh, uh, identified mechanism, uh, mechanisms have the stem cell in them. So the cancer stem cells are responsible for most of uh, the repopulation mechanisms. That actually uh, means that these are the cells that need to be targeted. Similarly to hypoxia, in um, uh, imaging, there are some uh, markers, there are some um, uh, 
um, radioisotopes that have specificity towards proliferation. And here you have the example of FLT, which is uh, one of the most commonly used, uh, not widespread in clinics, but in the preclinical studies, there are several reports that actually can uh, uh, show a very good um, uh, correlation between uh, the uptake of FLT PET and the tumor response, as you can see from this graph, uh, from uh, this image as well, in non small cell lung cancers. I mentioned before about stem cells, and uh, we are wondering whether this is a new concept. Well, the concept is new, but stem cells are not new. We know them for decades under the name of clonogenic cells, but now we can call them without being wrong as cancer stem cells because we know that they have uh, the, the original properties of the normal stem cells. So they originate from normal stem cells. Cancer stem cells are a subpopulation of cancer cells, a really small subpopulation, but despite their, their small uh, amount that can be found in tumors, they are highly aggressive because they have the uh, ability to proliferate indefinitely. They can recreate themselves through uh, symmetric divisions in the cell cycle. And as you've seen from my previous slide, actually they can repopulate the tumor. Therefore, they're uh, identification through markers is again crucial. What you see in the bottom picture um, that there are actually some uh, markers developed specifically for uh, cancer stem cells that can quantify uh, or at least uh, 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 to give us some uh, qualitative evidence on uh, their existence. So Going back to that big table of predictive essays, I think we can, we can add another um, a row here, uh, talking about the present or and even the future of these predictive essays. And what we have seen from my previous slides is that uh, the most promising way to deal with these challenges is imaging. And more than that is functional imaging through PET-CT because in PET, we already have some uh, specific tracers, specific for hypoxia, for proliferation, for cancer stem cells that have been defined. So there is hope. Now, a few words about normal tissue. What we discussed so far, it was uh, uh, all linked to tumor, like markers for tumor. Now, at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned the fact that normal tissues are also very important because we have to put all of these in balance. We know that normal tissue toxicity is usually the major limiting, uh, limiting factor yeah, for achieving an ideal therapeutic outcome. About 10% of radiotherapy patients, they do develop severe normal tissue toxicity. So no wonder why this aspect is important. It was shown that patients can exhibit a, a range of normal tissue effects, which are due to both deterministic variations and also some stochastic variations. However, clinical evidence, and this is the bottom line, shows really large both inter and intrapatient variations in both early or immediate and late side effects. Now, a few words about the latest. So here I'm not talking about old predictive essays. I'm uh, showing you the latest advances in normal tissue uh, biomarkers. And these uh, uh, one category would be the chromosome-based radio sensitivity assay. Uh, I'm showing you the results of a um, um, really recent 2019 study that used a cohort of 143 patients, so a really representative one. And the essay that was used was the G2 chromosomal essay, G2 referring to the G2 phase of the cell cycle before um, uh, cells enter the mitotic cycle. This test, uh, what does it do? Um, it tests the average yield of G2 chromatid breaks after one gray exposure to patient-derived uh, blood lymphocytes. So the study is done in blood lymphocytes and they are looking at those breaks that were caused by one uh, gray radiation. And as you can see, normally the data distribution would have, um, I mean, we would expect a Gaussian representation. 
and that's fine. Nothing wrong, you know, to be normal, like uh, somewhere in the middle. But the problem is those patients that showed a high radio sensitivity because they will overreact when you treat them, or those that show a high radio resistance, which means that perhaps all the cells in the body are radio resistance, resistant. So you could perhaps elevate the dose to the tumor because the normal tissue would allow you to do that. Another very interesting uh, aspect of normal tissue would be the biomarkers for um, uh, um, other biomarkers for normal tissue effects would be related to the telomeric biomarkers. Telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes. When the cell divides, the length of the chromosome drops. So the older the cell, the shorter the chromosome, uh, the shorter the telomere. Unfortunately, in normal cells, and that's why we are getting old, uh, it's very hard, if not uh, nearly impossible, to lengthen the, tel uh, the telomere. There is an enzyme called telomerase that actually can do that. So considering all this uh, short background, researchers were looking into the uh, telomere length and the telomerase activity uh, and showed that these are influenced by ionizing radiation. Therefore, the telomeres have been proposed as hallmarks of radio sensitivity, given that short telomeres enhance radio sensitivity. And what you can see in this um, illustration that was uh, taken again from a very recent publication, uh, this is a model for, for the fragility of the, uh, the, the telomere. So in case a cell has a fragile telomere, so the cell is a bit older, after um, uh, interaction with radiation, even if, though a single break strand is caused due to the, the fragility of the telomere, this can be easily transformed into a double uh, strand break. So uh, that would lead eventually to the cell death. So here is the link between the, the telomere length and properties and uh, radio resistance or the response to radiation that could be used as a possible other biomarker for normal tissue effects. But next to uh, all these individual factors such as DNA repair, lifestyle, there are common genetic variants that are associated with radiotherapy uh, adverse effects. And this is uh, uh, called uh, radiogenomics. So the big umbrella of radiogenomics aims to develop predictive assays for radiotherapy-induced radiation injuries. An example would be the single nucleotide polymorphism uh, for predictive assay. And another aim would be to gain information on the molecular pathways that are responsible for these radiation-induced normal tissue toxicities. So here you have a, a very like self-explanatory chart about uh, the aim of radiomics. Uh, and uh, linked to this is this uh, fairly um, well known uh, uh, in the radiological community, the single nucleotide polymorphism um, uh, as a predictive assay, which is a DNA sequence variation that occurs when a single nucleotide in the genome varies between patients. So here you can find something particular for each patient that can be used as a biomarker. So what you see in this chart is the way that radiogenomics can serve as an assay to predict individual radio sensitivity based on the single nucleotide polymorphism profile. Therefore, through radiogenomics, uh, one can identify high genetic risk patients and those that have, let's say, a normal response. So it would be like an alarm mark what to look at and how to care for those patients that need a different type of treatment. So how do we develop good biomarkers? How we assess if a biomarker is good or bad? First of all, uh, from what I've said before, you can um, draw the conclusion that they, can ha they have to be specific, specific for cancer stem cells, for hypoxia. They have to be uh, sensitive. Also, they have to have a predictive power and hopefully non-invasive. If um, we achieve all these uh, prerequisites, these biomarkers can be applied from diagnostic to outcome prediction and risk assessment. 
the field of biomarkers is developed and continuously developing. And in the chart below, you can see the prediction from the US cancer biomarker market uh, regarding applications also in personalized medicine. And the prediction is that by 2025, uh, the US will spend $33.7 billion towards this type of research, which is great. It is very promising. So as I said, there is hope. So uh, to sum up uh, all these things, we've seen that there is a large number of avail uh, available biomarkers. However, there is no gold standard that has been established so far. There is no uh, golden bullet that would be used that can reflect both the tumor and normal tissue characteristics as a whole. Therefore, perhaps in the future, a combination of biomarkers will be used for this purpose, purpose. but definitely there is more work in all these areas to um, achieve an increased uh, therapeutic ratio. And perhaps uh, radiomics, that uh, we can call it, as uh, others did, the bridge between medical imaging and personalized medicine is a real promise, as I uh, defined this at the beginning of my lecture, that could offer us more information that we can see uh, just uh, 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 with our naked eyes. And uh, the final um, slide, the final idea is uh, about gender specific radiotherapy, because I said that this is the third aspect that is very important in today's radiotherapy. We know that there are disparities in radio sensitivity between genders, but the fact is that most radiotherapy guidelines, as you are aware in your hospitals, they are based on population averages and not on demographic subgroups like males and females. So an observation that uh, um, uh, we've done uh, after reviewing the whole literature was that gender is really rarely the focus of a study and usually is just a variable that is added as an afterthought. So it's not the primary uh, uh, idea of that particular study. So clearly the recommendation would be that gender must be included as a match variable in cohort studies and also in randomized trials. Why is that? Well, the limited data that is available that actually looked into the gender differences in those uh, not gender specific cancers, obviously, but look here, rectal cancer, head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer that um, uh, is common to both genders show differences. Just uh, uh, what I um, um, circled there for esophageal cancer, a study showed that the tolerance dose for 50% complication rates in males can be up to 55.3 gray, while in females it's just 36.6 gray. Another study showed differences in progression and overall uh, um, survival in these two genders and the differences are significant. So I'm not go going into more details regarding the clinical studies, but the point is that there are differences between genders. And these are due to various factors, some that are well known, some that are still under study. It can be differences in uh, hormonal levels, the estrogen and its receptors, um, the recruitment of the X chromosome tumor suppre uh, suppressor gene, which can escape inactivation in a gender and not in another, and also the differences in uh, anatomy and uh, lipid uh, distribution among genders. These can all be factors that contribute to these differences. So, the aim of today's radiotherapy is definitely to increase the therapeutic ratio through personalized treatment. How do we achieve this? To identify biological differences between tumors, but also between normal tissue uh, response to radiation. And how do we do this? Using biomarkers, developing more specific biomarkers for both tumor and normal tissue, to do a gender-based analysis of clinical data, and to come up with some predictive models for patient stratification through, for instance, machine learning using radiomics, just based on images or radiogenomics that use image features together with individual genomic phenotype analysis. Have you seen this guy 
Probably not, because he does not exist. If he would exist as an average person, we would treat everyone as an average person. And if we treat people as an average person, we'll get average results. For some, we'll achieve a good effect of the treatment, for some, no effect at all. And for others, the adverse events would be worse, actually, than the uh, treatment results themselves. But if we personalize, and we keep in mind the different properties that I uh, encompassed in this presentation, then we can stratify patients or even individualize the therapy so everybody would have a great effect. Well, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions you have regarding my talk. Oh, thank you very much, Loredana. May I ask you to please stop sharing your screen? Okay, wonderful lecture. And I think that was a wonderful conclusion of this series of radiobiological lectures because we not only summarized the basics of radiation biology, but looked into the future. Uh, can I please have the questions on the screen? So, Jake, can you please unmute yourself? Oh. And also, so can I please um, start with a couple of questions? What do you see to be the biggest problem in the radioisotope internal dosimetry at the moment? Mm. I suppose the biggest problem is probably the lack of individualized dosimetry in general. And so even for therapeutic and I think mostly this is because there's a lot of additional work that's required to do individual dissymmetry. Um, so this of, will not be out of a job anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, but also you need more camera time. So you need to take more time points. You need to image at more time points. So it's a, a bit of an inconvenience to the patients as well to bring them in on subsequent times. But I guess more of a fundamental limitation yeah. for internal dissymmetry is just the spatial resolution of gamma cameras and even PET cameras mm -hmm. is... Uh, yeah. is it's not as anywhere near, say, CT. Um, yeah. So there's some limitations, yeah. Yeah. Laura Dana, you were talking about the models. Uh, yeah, models cannot always encompass everything. Rather than models, should we be talking something about like machine learning or artificial intelligence that would have more predictive power than maybe analytical models? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, I would um, uh, definitely encourage people to embrace uh, the applications of uh, artificial intelligence, let's just call it uh, uh, like broadly, in, um, in um, not just in medical physics, but in uh, the uh, all areas of uh, radiotherapy, because uh, there are several results out there. I'm not saying that they are all correct, but that they have potential depending on um, how well those uh, um, well, models are trained uh, in radiomics and radiogenomics that uh, showed us um, that actually artificial intelligence can bring some extra information from what we are used to. And uh, this uh, uh, term, actually, when you put together the radiomics with all the, the additional information um, uh, that uh, genomics or, or proteomics, and they all need a certain level of uh, deep learning to have incorporated because uh, um, uh, the technology, just the, the devices, the apparatus cannot do the whole thing for you. So we are talking about precision medicine. So obviously to have precision, uh, precise results, we need a huge amount of data. Big data cannot be handled um, um, singularly by humans. You need the help of machines to do all the processing and the statistical analysis for you. So in all these aspects, even as a big picture to process the big data that is out there, or to look at each individual image and extract the radiomic signature of the images, this would all lead to a more personalized approach in radiotherapy. Yes, I agree. Jake, what would you, con um, uh, dosimetry, I presume, does not only apply to nuclear medicine images, 
but also to targeted therapies such as targeted alpha therapy. Uh, what would be the biggest issues in using MERD or other dose calculations in targeted therapies? And considering that the decaying isotope might be decaying to number of other isotopes. Yeah, so I mean, one issue would be that that fundamental assumption when you use MERD in practice is often that you assume a, a homogeneous, homogeneous or a uniform distribution of disintegrations in your source organs. That's definitely a limitation um, that can make a real difference when you're especially looking at therapeutic activities and therapeutic mm -hmm. radionuclides. Another one in terms of particularly alpha therapy and targeted alpha therapy is is that there's a lot of biokinetic data um, applied to the parent nucleus. Um, so when you conjugate your alpha radionuclide to some biologically relevant molecule, um, you can sort of track where the parent is going, the alpha emitter is going. Um, but after the alpha decay has happened, we kind of have to assume that there's going to be breaking of that conjugate. So any daughters are not going to be uh, labeled to whatever target you're targeting at this point. So for alpha emitters that have uh, daughters who also emit alphas, for example, um, it's a bit of a concern because we're not always sure where those daughter alpha emitters go in the body. Um, so that's, that's an interesting area of active research is tracking where the daughter emitters go and the biokinetics of, of daughters. Thank you. Laura Dana, uh, how is personalized radiotherapy uh, can be implemented for transgender individuals that are undergoing hormonal therapy and are transitioning? Right. Um, I would uh, just give you an educated guess here because uh, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm also a physicist. And as I said in my presentation, unfortunately, though we know the differences between uh, uh, the different uh, uh, gender response, these are not implemented in trials. So nobody is, is treating differently uh, based on gender. Females, males, everybody is treated with the same protocol. Now, um, uh, to give you like at least partially a response, uh, uh, this would uh, be definitely in the future, if, if this transition will happen, like uh, the, the differential or differentiated treatment based on gender, I guess it would be up to the doctor to make uh, thorough tests uh, like hormonal, uh, for instance, because uh, if uh, we know that certain hormones uh, are uh, the main responsibles for the differences in response, then at the end of the day, it matters uh, what uh, hormones dominate in your body that would influence the response to therapy. So it would be perhaps a hormonal test based on which you say that, yes, is the estrogen, is the testosterone, or it's another one um, uh, that, uh, that dominates and that which uh, this, uh, defines you. And perhaps if one has a stronger impact on the final answer to radiotherapy, then the doctor, in case this gendered uh, therapy happens, can um, treat with a certain uh, uh, treatment regime or another one. Yeah, thank you. I was uh, eloquently answered. Jake, if someone wants to perform uh, MERT calculations in their department, what is the best software to use? Or does this software come with a particular SPECT camera when you're buying it from a, from a manufacturer? So there are some manufacturers who will provide some applications that can uh, do some dissymmetry for their particular camera. But a very um, general purpose software is the very famous Alinda, uh, or now it's called Alinda slash Exum. And so this was developed by Staben et al's group, so the Radar group, uh, which you would have seen all throughout my talk, very, very big people in MERD. Um, and one of the reasons to use the Alinda such Exum software, especially the second version, is there's now um, the dose factors for those fancy NURBS phantoms are used in, in that software. So I guess I would recommend that one. Thank you. Uh, Laura Dana, what is the role of national and international registries when developing personalized medicine? 
Well, uh, they should, and hopefully in the future they will play a big role. The problem with registries, and I'm getting back here to the, the big data, is the standardization and the, uh, to make the data uniform. So uh, uh, when you gather that data and you want to, to uh, get some specific information in order to predict a, a subgroup of patient's response to therapy, the data has to be standardized. So with the registries, international registries, as long as they are not aligned according to an international protocol, and if not all the data is gathered by all registries, so if, going back to gender, if that is one particular aspect, I mean, that usually is not lacking, but uh, other uh, important parameters can uh, can lack. Uh, we know all the, the all the problems that it wasn't clear what treatment regime uh, the patient had or whether it was treated with cobalt therapy or it was treated with the linear accelerator. So my point is that it's very important in order to do something with the data from the cancer registry, that data has to be standardized. So um, you can't just uh, mix apples and, and, and uh, oranges and uh, to get some pertinent uh, conclusions there. So this is one of the biggest challenges actually when processing the big data, whether from cancer registries or from other sources, to have uh, a harmonization of the data, a standardization of the data so you can actually take them and, and process them as such. Jake. Uh... How do you see the role of whole body PET, which is some of the most exciting development in the nuclear medicine, in my opinion, uh, impacting on uh, better pharmacokinetics measurements and MERD dosimetry? Can you unmute yourself? Yes, so whole body PET is a bit of a game changer in the biokinetics space um, because you, with short, um, short-lived radionuclides even, um, you can look at the biological clearance from all of the different organs in the body um, at the same time um, if you can have a field of view that covers the whole body. Um, so, you know, you could do really a continuous hour-long uh, PET scan for the whole body and get re very nice time activity curves for lots of different organs. Um, so whole body PET would be um, definitely excellent and would sort of push towards more individual um, dissymmetry based on individual biokinetics if you could do that routinely. One of yeah. the problem at the moment is that it costs $15 million, but hopefully it will become uh, more, uh, more available in, in future years. Loredana, what factors or parameters should we work with from clinical data uh, to start a study to contribute to a gender specific RT? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, nothing extraordinary, nothing extra from what uh, exists out there. Um, to, to draw some conclusions, uh, uh, whether there is a different need uh, um, to, to adjust treatment uh, based on the gender, you just have to process your data um, um, uh, uh, specifically for females and males. Go back to what you have in your clinics, do a retrospective study and analyze all the data as you would analyze it normally when you report the results of a study as a whole. Yeah, let's say you had um, a lung cancer um, a study where you um, enrolled 100 patients, yeah, and you uh, report on the outcome, normal tissue toxicity, tumor control, overall survivor, so on and so forth. Well, do the same thing, but separately for males and females and see if there are differences. And perhaps different nations might see different uh, uh, differences because we know that uh, there are not just gender related, but there are racial related differences as well. So you might find the uh, different differences between genders as um, uh, the Caucasians or um, I don't know uh, what other um, uh, race would find. So in summary, yeah, you don't need extra parameters. You just have to do a retrospective study on what you have in your clinics, but process the data separately, like 
uh, for females and for males. When I say data, is everything that you have there regarding the normal dosimetry, yeah, normal tissue toxicity and uh, tumor-related uh, data, and see what your conclusion is. Maybe you would conclude that for certain cancers there are no differences, so you can go on with the treatment as usual. And perhaps for others, I just gave you the example with esophagus, the differences were pretty uh, significant. So in that case, you can maybe talk to the doctors and, and uh, decide on treatment adjustments for the future. Um, it's interesting how this gender related um, aspect was uh, is, is brought up by um, uh, your questions. Here, I would just like to mention uh, the fact that um, last night, it was my night in Europe, so it's your morning in Malaysia. Uh, I just came across, it was absolutely uh, incidentally, I came across uh, uh, a paper published now in April 2021 in Nature Reviews Cancer on gender specific uh, radiotherapy. And they are raising the, the alarm mark, the issue of how important this would be in the future. So I recommend you, I don't remember the first author name, but if you, it's Nature Cancer, uh, Nature Reviews Cancer is the April issue. I doubt there are more gender specific articles. So just uh, uh, look it up and uh, I'm sure that would uh, also uh, bring some additional uh, uh, information uh, for those that are interested in this aspect. How interesting. Uh, one last question before I hand over to Chai Hong. And I don't know which one of you wants to address this one. How do we determine which group of patients should go for personalized dosimetry while others can be treated with general standardized dosimetry? Since personalized dosimetry is time consuming to perform for every single case. I'll let you take that, Laura Anna. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't think there is a there is a general or there is a recipe for this. Uh, I, I I can't personally give you an advice how to group those patients that would need personal dosimetry or not. It would be absolutely wonderful to have in vivo dosimetry available for everyone, but obviously we cannot do this, and that's a good point. It is really time consuming. So generally, there are some types of uh, uh, anatomical locations that are more tricky to treat than others. There are some groups, pediatric patients that need more attention, those that are prone to develop second cancers. Depends very much um, uh, on the location of the tumor. If it's in the uh, immediate vicinity of some critical organs, then it would be advisable. At least you don't have to do it throughout the treatment. Do a few tests if you have the possibility to use TLD or other uh, in vivo dosimetries to use them for the first fraction or first couple of fractions to see what the, the dosage is. And uh, if you are happy yeah, with uh, what the results show, you can go on with your treatment. So that depends on the person. You can't really group them. As I said, tumor location, the history of the patient, if it's a re-irradiation that uh, necessitates obviously more attention and definitely pediatric patients. Yeah. Uh, sometimes certain genetical conditions make oh, patients absolutely. more radiosensitive. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and very complex treatments like TBI, TBE, where the patient is really put at risk because of the whole body irradiation, if I may add. Yeah. Oh, that, that would be compulsory. Yes, my... absolutely. That is compulsory. Yeah. Okay. Jake, Loredana, thank you so much for wonderful lectures. Uh, I hope everyone has learned a lot and everyone is welcome to re-watch the lectures um, when they will be posted on YouTube. Can I please hand over to Associate Professor Chai Hong Yong for concluding remarks? Thank you so much, Eva, for your excellent moderation today. And thank you so much, Professor Loredana and Zach, for your time and really wonderful lectures. We have learned a lot from both of you. <laughs> okay, and thanks to the participants for staying all the way back to the end. Uh, I just want to wrap up our course this uh, so-called ASEAN College of Medical Physics uh, Professional Course 2021 Sessions. I'm sharing my screen now. I hope you can see my screen. All right. So uh, I would like to present you some analysis and feedback uh, from what we get uh, in the past uh, three weeks. So we have a 
consecutively uh, three Fridays on the topics of radiobiology. So we structure our program in such a way that we don't want to burden or we don't want to overload our participants uh, with the very heavy uh, physics, theories and mathematics. So we break it down into uh, three sessions uh, that was carried out on three consecutive Fridays. So we have uh, Dr. Ekkao Eng to give us a, on the overall uh, overview on the radiobiology of tissue interaction with radiation. Then Professor Eva Bezak uh, has shown us uh, examples on the LQ model, TCP, NTCP calculation, Lyman culture, Quantec, and so on. And I have to admit myself that <laughs> it's difficult for me to follow up this, to follow these lectures because uh, very comprehensive and a lot of formulas and calculations. But it is very beneficial that um, we have actually uploaded the sessions, the lectures on YouTube, and we have seen a lot of participants have actually uh, rewind back the lectures. And up to today, we have up to like 600 views on those lectures. And the second week, we have uh, Dr. Wendy Phillips and Professor Dr. Fuad Ismail, who is a clinician, uh, clinical oncologist, to share with us on the clinical application of the LQ model radiobiology of the uh, outer fascination hypo hyper uh, therapy hypoxia and extension to the LQ for SAPR. And Professor Fuad also uh, sharing, sharing his uh, views on treatment interactions or retreatment and combined therapy. And he has answered a lot of uh, questions here from the point of view of the clinicians. And this week, we are very lucky. We have uh, Dr. Zach Foster and Professor Loredana to share with us on the very comprehensive uh, MRD formulation uh, as well as on the diagnostic procedures. And we had a very fruitful discussion just now. And Professor Loredana shared with us the latest development of the biomarkers and its clinical applications. And very interestingly, we have a very uh, good discussion, I think, on transgender or gender-specific treatment. It's a very new topic. And also, uh, Professor Loredana also shared with us the recent publication on natural reviews. So who of, hope all of us can have a, a further read on these issues. So uh, I can't thank you enough, Prof. Eva. <laughs> And Dr. Ekhal Eng, Dr. Wendy Phillips, Professor Fra Ismail, Dr. Zach Foster, and Professor Loredana with us today. Uh, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to, uh, to be our wonderful lecturers. And just to let all of us, all of you know that um, initially we would like to charge for this course because uh, it's quite taxing and we need to find a suitable platform uh, to organize the course. But in the end, we determined, we decided that we will just offer it as a free webinar so that everyone can join, everyone can uh, share the knowledge and also beneficial from the learning. And we also decided to upload it to YouTube so that everybody can uh, rewind back uh, I mean, review back the lectures after that. And all of our lecturers here, our speakers here, they didn't receive any honorarium or any allowances from this course. And thank you so much. So uh, let me just show you a little bit on our statistics. So uh, for the first Friday, 9th of April, we have 445 participants registered. And that actually uh, came to our surprise <laughs> that because initially we expected it might be just 100 to 200 participants. So, and hence, um, we have to uh, find alternative. So we decided to open it up or live broadcast it on YouTube so that we can handle the more numbers of participants. So in the end, we got 289 participants attended live during the sessions. Uh, among them, about one third are, were watching from YouTube and the rest are, were participating from Zoom. And after we posted the YouTube uh, recorded lectures, uh, up to today, we have 609 views on YouTube. And on the second Friday, 16th of April, uh, the number registered have increased to 570, uh, 578 and 265 attended. And the YouTube's view up to today is 284. And I'm sure this number will uh, keep uh, accumulating. And today, we have uh, 582 participants registered, 161 attended, uh, about one half watching from YouTube and another half on Zoom. Uh, this number 
drop a little bit, but it's still kind of expected because it's a, uh, the third day of the course. But I'm sure that uh, after we uploaded to the YouTube and more people can actually come and uh, review back the lectures and we'll keep, give you an update after that. So uh, participants by country, uh, this is about more than half of them are from Malaysia. And we have 23% from Indonesia, 10% from Philippines. And we also have uh, numbers from other countries as well, such as Singapore, Brunei, India, Taiwan, Cambodia, Vietnam, Australia as well, Nepal, and United Kingdom, Hong Kong, and United States. By professions, 56% are medical physicists, 30% are students, and we also have radiographers, lecturers. We have two oncologists and two radiologists with us, and two from regulations, uh, and so on. So in terms of feedback, uh, how helpful was the content presented at the workshop from a scale of zero to five? Fortunately, <laughs> we have a high, uh, high percentage, 62% mentions that it's extremely helpful and 34% mentions it's uh, helpful and we don't get, luckily we didn't get <laughs> 0 0.01 and 2. And how likely would you recommend our future online workshops to a colleague? 73% uh, mentions they were definitely, they're extremely likely to in, uh, recommend it to their colleagues and 25.6% answer yes, it's likely. And again, we don't get uh, numbers who rated us zero or one. And about the duration of the workshop, uh, one to five, so three is uh, just nice. So half of them think the duration just nice, meaning uh, two hours for each session for three uh, weeks. And 27.5% say it's slightly long and 20% say it's too long. So in the future, we might need to restructure our program uh, so that we don't overload the participants. And these are the most recommended uh, future topics that the participant would like to hear about. Uh, the top one is radiotherapy, second radiobiology, SBRT, dosimetry, QAQC, brachytherapy, SRS, radiation treatment other than cancer, Gap corrections, RT for COVID cancer patients, dose and impact of radiation in environment. And we received uh, 284 comments from participants uh, up to the last uh, session because we haven't done the feedback for today yet. Uh, thank you so much for all of you, to all of you for giving us these very uh, valuable comments. Really appreciate it. And we run the I guess this is done by an AI software. <laughs> so we selected the top uh, 30 keywords uh, given by our participants. So basically, um, the comments are very positive. Good presentation, good, great webinar, good work, good lectures, and so on. Yeah, thank you so much. And I just like to uh, show with you a little bit. I, I think some of you might would like to know the comments uh, from the participants. So th this is just a selected comments. Uh, the first one, <laughs> I appreciate if there's more courses from Professor Eva Bezak. She's making radio biology easier for understanding to me. It was extremely helpful and entertaining. Keep doing more. The speakers are nice and very informative. Excellent webinars. Looking forward to more diverse topics. Thank you. And very good information to new radio biologists like me. And very nice YouTube platform need to be improved. Zoom is okay. And good teamwork. Thank you. And there's nothing really for me to comment and suggest. It's a very good educational lectures and I learned a lot. Thought I'm still way too early stage to be given this lecture, still on the second semester of university. But otherwise, I think this is a really helpful lectures. I hope to understand more in years to come. And just for information, I did a background uh, survey. Uh, this comment actually is from an oncologist trainee. So she's currently in the second uh, semester in the clinical oncology course. And among all, I like this <laughs> comment the most. Very, very straightforward, 100. I don't know what it means. I, I guess it means 100% uh, perfect. I hope so. And there are some other comments as well. Uh, so... Mm, okay, let's see some. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I highlighted the gold color, golden color here. Sangat bermanfaat because this is one of my favorite comments. This is in Malay actually, by the way, Malay language. Uh, it means very beneficial cause. And more comments here. So I'm not going to read one by one. Uh, basically, uh, maybe today's topic very interesting and really brought my knowledge in terms of treatment to metastasis cancer. This is from the last week uh, course, last week sessions. Two hour session is great. The sample calculation was really good. Uh, more topic on TPS and perhaps to use a bit of video or animated explanation in between slides. Okay, thank you for the comments. We will take notes. Uh, brief improved technical issues. So we would also like to apologize if there are some technical issues uh, or errors during the sessions and we will try to improve it in the future. And among all, uh, guess which one is my favorite comment? <laughs> Best workshop. <laughs> Best workshop, wow. Sharp eyes, Eva. <laughs> I, I, I like this the most. Hope to attend more training courses with this organization. It really helped me a lot in my studies now. Uh, it's really happy to hear about these comments. It, it, it really gives us the uh, encouragement to do more in the future. So we offer it free and hopefully can help some students and trainees along the way. Okay, so a recommendation for future improvement. So, uh, so we will read all the 284 comments and from there, we actually summarize it, uh, the useful recommendation for future. The top one is more courses like this in future. Second, increase the duration or length of workshop, more time for discussion, longer Q&A sessions. Yeah, and then uh, on YouTube, this is really interesting. Uh, this is actually the first time we set up an account under Ecom, and today we already have 60 uh, subscribers. And the total views for our live broadcast from this whole Radio Biology series already reached 897 views. And the total views of all sections, this is the uh, individual sessions, is 151. These numbers are really encouraging. So if you would like to uh, rewind back the lectures, you can go to YouTube and just search the keyword Aircom and you can see a series of our lectures there. So uh, last but not least, I would like to thank uh, the whole committee uh, who organizing this workshop uh, from our Aircom director, Professor Dr. Quan Hong Eng. He is extremely busy, he, he couldn't join us today. The course coordinators, Dr. Ek Hao Eng, uh, actually he's taking the lead uh, to propose this uh, series of workshops and I'm just helping him, uh, our moderators, our invited speakers. And we have uh, still have Professor Loredana with us now and Dr. Jack Foster. Uh, I would really like to thank uh, our assistant, uh, Ms. Asil Hisham and Ms. Hany Tan. They have done a wonderful job. Thank you so much. They work hard at the back scene. And don't for, uh, never forget, CFOM is our mother founda foundation uh, who set up this ASEAN College of Medical Physics. And thank you so much. And to all of you as well. So this picture was taken last uh, week. So today, after this, we're going to take another group photo so that we can have a good report. And thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we, we, I apologize if there's any... Um, inconveniences or any hassles during the sessions. And thank you so much, uh, all the speakers, the helpers, and all of you who attended the sessions. And for those, uh, our Muslim colleagues, uh, wish you Selamat Hari Raya. Uh, uh, for the foreigners, uh, this is our Malay New Year, Muslim New Year, uh, next month. So now, uh, Currently, it's actually the fasting month for all the Muslims. So I would like to wish you a happy fasting month and also Sama Hari Raya. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Professor Loredana. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zach Foster. Thank you, Ekhal. Are you still here? And Asil and Hani as well. Asil, would you like to show share your screen? Hi. Yeah, I just already. Uh, we'd like to start off with uh, to everybody to turn on their cameras so that we can take a nice group photo. Is that okay with everyone? 
Yeah, I'll give a minute for everyone. I can see some people are still at work. Should we say cheese or <clears throat> acorn or radio biology? <laughs> <laughs> I will start taking photos now. One, two, three. Good. Okay. Couple of slides. done with the photos, I'll be sharing my screen again. Thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, so this is the feedback form. Please fill it up for the feedback of today's lecture as well as indicate if you would like to have a certificate, which will be provided within the next few days. Thank you very much, Asir. And thanks again to every one of you here. Uh, so this is the last day of a radio biology series. Wish you all the best. And please give us um, feedback, honest comments, and we hope we can improve it in the future and we hope we can see each other again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Bye. Thank you, Loredana and Jack. Thanks, Chao. Okay. And Asya. Hi, Ekhao. Hi. How is our course? Yeah, very good. It went well. So we we're actually doing uh, some uh, on uh, passivity integration. Ah, integration. Mm -hmm. Thanks very Yeah, very nice uh, session. Thanks, Eva and Chai Hong. My pleasure. I think Eva has left, is it? Eva has left. Yeah, Eva has left. It's, it's really wonderful lectures today. Enjoy it so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I miss uh, some part uh, partially join. So I miss some part. I will definitely catch up from the YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. And Asil, thank you for bringing up the very hot topic to discuss. That's very interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Asia and Hanji for helping out. No problem. Thank you. No for <laughs> uh, I've stopped the recording. Uh, should I stop the live or? How many is you on YouTube now? 27. 27, is it? Yes. Okay, maybe we still need to project the screen as well. Okay. Chai Hong? Chai Hong? Yes, I how? Yeah, I just sent you a notes that we have discussed last week, a very three points not only. Mm -hmm. What uh, Prof. Hong has uh, mentioned in the last uh, last meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe later on, uh, we'll get all this information and then uh, we'll get the information first, see how it goes. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. So thank you everyone. I'm leaving. Thank you, Echo. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Doctor, should I turn off the live setting right now? Yes, 